actually formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. Welcome once again to Pennzoil at the half, everyone. Along with Dean Smith and Clark Kellogg, I'm Greg Gumbel at halftime. Stanford leading Purdue by 37 26 score. Coach, what is Gene Cady saying to his Boilermakers, and at what level is he saying it? I can't repeat that, but I think you'll see a different, more aggressive Purdue team coming back. Stanford's been sensational defensively, and Purdue probably will be the second half. You just can't get waxed on the boards the way Purdue is and expect to win the game. It has been buffet-style all first <laughs> half for Stanford. That means plenty of second-shot opportunities, and Jaron Collins came in off the bench and gave him a huge lift. And Stanford is out-rebounding the Boilermakers 29-11 to at halftime. Meanwhile, in the other game in progress, in St. Petersburg, the top seed, Duke, leading Syracuse 40-33. to They're just underway in the second half. Let's take you out there live and join Jim Nance and Billy Packer. Duke has not scored here in the second half. Blue Devils led 40 to 30 at halftime. But a foul on the inside. Bergen of Syracuse is second. And Rashawn McLeod, the Duke top scorer on the season, to the line for two. He has struggled here tonight. Only two of eight from the field in the first half. Jim, as I said, uh, he is struggling, and a guy who hasn't been struggling of late, he has been tremendous since the Christmas break. Remember after the Michigan game in which he did not play well, he went home at Christmas time, really dejected and down, but has come back and has played extremely well. All-conference player, all-ACC tournament player. They lost that game at Michigan in December, and McLeod start, started the very next game, has started every game since. And matter of fact, uh, was elevated to try captain in February as a compliment by his teammates for the way he's played. Bush on the outside. That was quite a gesture. They had a team meeting and decided to add another captain. The team voted for him. Wojciechowski, by the way, with his third foul. Later here, UCLA and Kentucky. Wojo's having all kinds of problems with Hart. In fact, Hart probably doing as good a job with ball penetration against Wojo as any player I've seen the last couple of years. Freshman William Avery, though, shined in the first half. Over the top, over Brand they go. Thomas blocked by Brand. Wow. Thomas had to fight off the weak side defensive help, and Brand was waiting for him on a put-up. You'll see the ball goes inside. Brand does a good job sealing. Then he sees the weak side help. There's the block. Hart, who has 13 to lead the way for Syracuse. 15 on the shot clock. Todd Bergen put on the line. That's a two. Beautiful pull up by Bergen. Top man for the Orange with five points tonight. So it's not his best performance so far. Avery, long range three. That's how he started when he came into the game. Put up the three, four or five feet beyond the three-point line. First field goal, and it's a three of the second half for Duke. Blue Devils led by as many as 12 in the first half at 28 to 16. Syracuse chopped into that lead, trimmed it to four before a little burst by Duke before the half made it 40-30 at halftime. Jim, notice what a great job Syracuse does in getting back down court so that Duke can't get advantage of any of the fast break opportunities. Syracuse number 33, Tom Thomas with his second. What kind of game has this been to this point, Billy? Well, I think that Syracuse's defense has been very effective taking away from Duke what they'd like to do, and that is the, to get Trajan Langdon off with his outside shots and McLeod scoring. And I think Duke, uh, with, their, with their bench, has been as extremely effective. Very seldom do you see a team with a nice working margin like Duke has and not have their key scorers really involved in the game. Jimmy Beheim doing a nice substitution job, realizing he can't play those five starters 35 or six minutes in this game. McLeod, first 57 games of his career, played for St. John's before he transferred to Duke. One of two.
so, just under seven mean, 17 minutes to play in the second half, and Duke with a 10-point lead. We'll keep you updated on that score throughout the evening. We want to remind you, coming up next in the second half of our regional semifinal doubleheader, Tubby Smith and his Kentucky Wildcats meet Steve Lavin and the UCLA Bruins in the South, while in the Midwest, a couple of Cinderella's, 13 seed Valparaiso, 8 seed Rhode Island. It's up next here on CBS. In UCLA's second round game against Michigan, the Bruins came away with the win, but not before losing the go to the Final Four continues. Pennzoil at the half has been sponsored by Pennzoil, specially formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. 39 Duke as we check the Microsoft data bank. Only two number five seeds have won a regional semifinal game, a Sweet 16 game, since they went to 64 teams back in 85. Mississippi State, which went on to the final fourth, the Meadowlands, and Virginia back in 89. Virginia lost in that regional final to Michigan. You know, Jim, it's interesting you see the uh, team. Here's a little first-time half-court trap out of the 2-3. Langdon, wraparound pass to Battier. Tough call on Bergen. Good job by Trajan Langdon to recognize the 2-3 trap. Nice job by Jimmy Beheim on that timeout. Three on Bergen, three on Yanulis, who's sitting right now. So Battier to the line for two. All freshman player from the ACC this year. Out of Birmingham, Michigan. Country Day High School, Chris Weber's high school. Yep. Set a record, Jim, kind of interesting. In charges taken this year, uh, new record for Duke University. Unusual for a six foot nine inch freshman to set a record for charges taken. Show how intense he is defensively. Also very active on the offensive glass. Probably Duke's best rebounder on the offensive end. Was he held? No call against Chappelle. Well, Chappelle really did a pretty good job with his body there. I didn't see him grab any shirt. Bergen just couldn't get around him. The backdoor cut was there, although the angle wasn't best for the pass. Avery kicks it back out. Langdon three. Brand just controlling the inside. Gets another chance. Oh, nope. good steal. That's a quick hand to Griffin. And the foul call against Battier of Duke. Jim, Trajan Langdon is thinking in this basketball game instead of just playing the game. You notice he was standing out there, not expecting the shot. He's now one for eight. He just has to get consumed into the game. Very unusual to see a guy of his ability get caught up mentally in a basketball game where he's not letting things go instinctively. Griffin misses the short one. Inside, Blackwell draws the action. This could be it is again on Battier, back-to-back -back fouls at both ends, so he's got three now. UCLA, Kentucky coming up later here, and Valparaiso against Rhode Island in St. Louis. UCLA uh, just shorthanded and undermanned again, and that whole situation just inflamed yesterday when Rico Hines, it was revealed, sliced his hand trying to butter a roll. Well, I'll give you a little hit when Baron Davis told me yesterday. Look for a man by the name of Knight to step up. Is it possible that Steve Lavin can get a bench that was really short in the first place to come in and play against a team like Kentucky in a big game like this? Crazier things have happened. Billy Knight. In the NCAA tournament, yes. Billy Knight, the freshman. 47-42. So that's the tip from one of the players. We'll see how it plays out. Aaron Davis says he's going to be in a uniform tonight. Not going to play, but he's going to be in a uniform. Down to the line for a three-point possibility. Boy, Griffin was right down there with him. It shows you how strong. Now, here's Griffin getting in the Duke huddle. That reminds me of the shenanigans, Jim. Duke, Carolina. We'll see the play down on the inside here. Brand with that great touch, and he's so strong. But Duke Carolina, somebody from Duke steals Michael Jordan's jersey. Right away, Grant Hill's jersey's gone. Mike Krzyzewski has a framed picture gone. What happens is they find out that the Duke students had that Michael Jordan jersey and had planned to drop it during the Duke Carolina game at Duke. They were caught, so the jersey has now been returned. They'd never give up over there going against each other. There is still, though, a missing item. Is Still one item missing, though, Billy. White item is Grant Hill's uh, jersey is still missing. It'll show. 
Bounce it inside the brim, a little fade away, in and out. And active hands with Blackwell. Here comes Syracuse. Chance to trim it to four. Excellent feed. Bergen filling the lane. Blackwell doing a good job on the glass defensively. Mike Krzyzewski has to know where to turn. And he's going to try to turn to Trajan Langdon. Does he have anything? A quick burst by Todd Bergen. Hart just laid it up for him. Perfect alley-oop. Look at how soft that is, Jim. Bergen with 11 in the second half. Jim, look at the rotation on this ball. You see how soft that went up there? Hardly any rotation at all. Just a perfect pass. Look at the seams. I mean, yeah, you couldn't right. put it in a guy's hands any better than that. Exactly. Got the NCAA uh, <laughs> logo, logo <on>. emblazoned <laughs> right there, right between his hands. Well, normally, a ball that's coming off hard has got a lot of spin to it. That ball went up there just perfectly floating, easy to catch and put away. Hard to do on the dribble. Hart's having a fine game. Wojo in now at the point. I think that Trajan Langdon's going to have to hit a jump shot here to gain some confidence. And it's a key that might put him back in the game at this pivotal spot. Stepping in, now stuck back outside, under 10 on the shot. Carrowell with the head fake drives. Good Battle push off. Griffin Bergen with the board. Good job by Griffin to push McLeod out of the way. Griffin lost control of it in the lane. And Syracuse ball off Wojohowski. Well, you know Wojo will dive for a loose ball. Blackwell doing a good job. You know, Blackwell this year, eight double-doubles. He's got games like 16 rebounds against Villanova. Winner at the buzzer beat St. John's in the Big number East Tournament. This fella has really had an outstanding year. And Bergen has come alive with his jump shot. Scored nine of the last ten. And a little touch foul on the cloud. His second. Pizza Hut salutes the academic all-stars from Syracuse. Marius Yanoulis, who has a 3.84 GPA with a double major, computer science and economics. And Taman Domzalski from Duke, who has a 3.49 GPA, majoring in history. Alcina in the bonus already, so he hits the front end of a one and one There's Jim Beheim's wife, Julie. Well, he said Alcina having problems from three. If he steps in a little bit, looks like he's more comfortable. Can bring it to two. 49 46 Duke. And here's where that jump shot gets tough against the zone defense. You start to tighten up a little bit. The cloud detected by Alcina. And the cloud still wanting to put the ball on the floor inside the zone. Finds himself with no place to go. Duke only 2 of 12 from the field in the second half. This is the kind of defensive performance that we saw last week when Syracuse put the clamps on New Mexico. Here's Langdon. Impossible shot. That yeah, really forced it off balance. And a hold called on McLeod. Oh, Blackwell did a great job. First of all, he held McLeod. McLeod retaliated. Blackwell too strong for him. Third on McLeod. Back to the other end for a one-on-one. Trajan Langan took that jump shot. It really wasn't there, Jim. Not his kind of shot. We'll see the retaliation. There is McLeod, Blackwell pushing both ways. McLeod gets called. First time we've seen a Mr. Blackwell get undressed. <laughs> and he'll head to the line for a one-on-one. Blackwell, two NCAA tournament games, eight points, ten rebounds in both against Iona and New Mexico. It's a big one. They'll shoot one more. Down to two. Remember, they were down 12 in the first half. Ten at halftime. Tip the top. Cheat it all. Second time. All tied at 49. And remember the big block he just made inside of McLeod, so he's really coming through. He's playing the center of the 2-3 zone, doing a nice job there as well. Keeping an eye on Brand in that area. 
And here's where that perimeter shot becomes so tough and not what you want from a freshman. You gotta get the ball down inside if you're Duke. Avery had hit that a couple of times, but not with this Syracuse rally now. Doesn't fall for him. Syracuse can take the lead. The last lead for the Orange was 5-4. Oh, where's that going? Almost hit the shot clock. Oh, right back yep. comes Syracuse. Griffin with a terrific steal. Wojo looking around. Classic charge. Langdon held his position. It's the second on Hart. But Wojo, Jim, really had the numbers and should have been able to go ahead and make something work on that break. Ball hits long, comes off. Oh, China, left hand, then right hand, and puts it in. Time out of the floor. Syracuse has battled back to tie the number one seed of 49. Jim Brando, Al McGuire, Craig James, Stanford with a seven-point lead. Four minutes gone here in the second half. During that uh, timeout, they were checking Miller, who apparently uh, had been somewhat injured. You see Madsen picking up his third foul. Al, we, we touched on attrition a few moments ago. Clearly, here's the bumping going on. There's a little butterfly <laughs> that's for you. A, that's, a butter, that's an elbow to the jaw. That's down for the count. As Coach Lombardi said, the great football coach from Green Bay, you got to play with little injuries. Austin. Too strong. Matson clears. He have a present, Matson. Nine rebounds in the game for him. Well, he's got to be very careful on the defensive end with three fouls. Sauer now down low with him. Remember, Tim Young already saddled with four fouls. The ball may have been deflected somewhat by Robinson. Get the ball in Austin's hands. Let him run the show. Austin trying to beat Weems off the dribble. Robinson on the glass. Now it's McQuay down low and a reach in. I think Collins fouled that time, Tim. Jaron Collins getting his first. Stanford foul on Jaron Collins. His first. The ebb and flow of this game. Back and forth with Stanford closing with a 15-3 spurt. Upon that, outstanding play from its bench. Jaron Collins joining up with Mark Madsen after Tim Young had picked up three fouls in the first half. He has an early fourth here in the second, and the Cardinal lead is down to seven. Long rebound to Weems, and uh, he's still looking to get on track. He's 0 for 6 from the floor. Try to get the ball down to Madsen, if he can get the fourth foul on Cardinal. Tough shot. And oh, contact. Matson again. Oh, you can't give Matz an inside position like that. That's a Morton sin. Now that's his 10th rebound of the game. Let's go to Craig James. He's got an injury report for us, Craig. Well, Timmy B, Brad Miller's in the training room right now. He's getting stitches on his chin. They said it's going to take about two to three more minutes to get back on the court, which means that's bad news for Miller. Novocaine will not take effect. He's going to feel it, but he will be back in the game. Also bad news for the man you saw on your screen there, Gene Gaty. He needs him on the floor, Al. Even if Miller doesn't score, he creates double teams that allow open shooters along the perimeter. It also allows a high post to feed the low post for the Boilermakers. Well, Robinson sits down. Cornell back on the floor with Mayfield McQuay. Chad Austin. They say he's a sophomore, but don't forget the Mormon religion. He went to Spain for two years for the mission. Look at Collins again, keeping it alive for Stanford. Outstanding work. Oh, he sits aboard. He stepped on that line and they missed it with him back court. Got themselves a fresh clock. Weems. 0 for 8. Collins again getting position and fouled underneath. It appeared to be McQuay, the guilty party. Did he step in the line or didn't he? Yes, he did. He's totally toe toe. <laughs> Too close to call. Uh, a cliffhanger for Coach McGuire. And here comes Miller back, stitches and all. This game not for the faint of heart. McQuay has three, so he sits. 
Miller, who's playing with three, back on the floor after being stitched up. Look at that work on the offensive glass. That is devastating for a Gene Cady coach team. Well, the second half here, they've been putting bodies on everybody except for the last time when Mark Matson got the inside position. And Jerron Cornell picks up the foul as uh, they were prepared to trigger in the inbounds. Well, Stanford will have to do it again from the wing. I know neither team likes playing zone, but in the next eight minutes of more fouls are called, I think the teams are going to have to go zone to protect their big men down low defensively. Cardinal led by 11 at the intermission. Cling to a seven-point cushion. Six minutes deep in the second half. Cardinal has been on a drought in the second half. Lee. Again, the very active Jaron Collins working hard and the foul underneath. Too much uh, hands by Mendez that time. Ryan Mendez down low. That is the sixth, so from now on, the Boilermakers are in a one and one, and we got 13 minutes and a lot of change. 46 seconds left. Only three for Purdue. Stanford three of 13 shooting in the second half. So they've come out of the gate slowly here in St. Louis in the second half. Off the curl, Austin, he loves that. Oh, but the iron unkind to Purdue. Cardinal down on the deck. He called the timeout. Nice call. Very difficult that time, Tim. He caught the ref's eye in the baseline. The academic All-Stars recognize one player on each team for academic excellence. For tonight's game, the All-Stars are Madsen of Stanford, who carries a 3.12 GPA and produced Chad Kirkhoff, majoring in mechanical engineering. Well, it appears the halftime conversation that uh, was documented by Craig James in his interview that Gene Cady had with his team did get at least the attention of his team on the offensive glass. Oh, he was like a lion in there, most likely. Smoke was coming out of his ears. But the one thing he had to get over is that they have to box out underneath. What happened is that Stanford had 15 points on putbacks where uh, Purdue had none in the first half. Jaron Collins, his entry into the game on that front line has really given them a quickness to the ball that the Boilermakers haven't had. Miller misses a chippy. Pulled down by Madsen. Mendez being checked by Cornell in the corner. Lee. Nice. nice. Good stop to the deuce. Seven in the game for Lee. Well, that ended a four-minute drought for Stanford. Good flash by Cardinal. See what, ha see what happens that time is that Mark Madsen couldn't go him because he'd pick up a foul. He'd let him have the shot inside. Both teams, I go inside every time because the big men can't commit any fouls to be uh, sitting on uh, on the bench. Remember, Madsen does have three, two of which he picked up in the first seven minutes of the second half. Momentum has definitely gone to uh, Purdue, but they're still seven down. Rejected. Nice work by Eldridge. Uh oh, there's the fourth on Cardinal. That's only the third foul on Cardinal. Oh, excuse me, I thought it was the fourth. Overplay got out of position. Good call by the referee. This guy leaves part of his body on the floor every game. And he still has to sit, even with the three and 12 plus minutes remaining in the game. The good news is that Cornell and uh, McQuay have got plenty of playing time. And uh, for Gene Cady, he can take some comfort in the fact that the foul situation has balanced somewhat with the Stanford front line. Well, the big thing is that Mark Matson got a few fouls on him. That's the most comfort. Well, Matson can beat you by himself with that height and that body and that strength. And another example of what Jaron Collins has been able to bring, the ability to put the ball on the floor from a front court position. We'll get to the foul line. He's a good post player. But he does also quite well. When you kick it into the post to him, he'll kick it out to the guards. It's yeah. not like some centers. When they get the ball down there, they never kick it out. It's like a big black hole. It never comes back out. Gary McQuay did pick up his fourth. So that means he'll go to the pine. Mike Johnson will come back in. Mike Robinson returns. And uh, Jaron Collins off the bench already with a double-double, Al, the freshman from North Hollywood, now with 12 points and 10 rebounds. 
half of them on the offensive boards. Well, Coach Monty thought that this was his best freshman class ever with the Twins coming. They usually don't get double sets of uh, blue chip players. And he was thrilled when they decided to come. Eldridge. Madsen on the glass with Miller. That may be number four on Mark Madsen. I think it might be on Mendez. Yeah, I think they catch a break. Mark Madsen, that is his fourth. No, I'm correct. It is yeah. Madsen. It is Madsen picking up his fourth. And don't forget, it's the one and one now. Big down the down the uh, down the stretch here. It's a long stretch. You got 11 minutes and 53 seconds left here. You got to be able to bury that first foul shot in the one and one. Did you see Gene Cady hand over the towel to Miller? Taking care of the nose, the chin. Maxson sits down with four. <laughs> I think Gene, anytime his team plays, he, he loves having a, a towel to wipe a little blood for the game. It's his kind of game once that occurs. And the Boilermakers, six of six from the line. Just as we mentioned it, the Jinx hits them. That's their first miss of the night as a team. Best free throw shooting team remaining in the 1998 NCAA tournament. Off the cut, Mosley. Nice curl for Mosley. And the blood still coming from the chin of Miller. That they have another stoppage of play. I don't know that the officials have caught it as yet. Working in on Mark Seaton. Robinson on the wing. Too strong. Miller. Oh, did he? Wow, big time hustle. And an elbow thrown. Wow, he's cut, he's cut real bad. Stop that game a second. I think wow. he might be cut there. We'll need Ferdy Pacheco before this is oh, over. Oh, God. Gil Clancy. Well, the blood had been flowing prior to him hitting the deck as we documented moments ago. So the flea flowing blood that we see now was already coming down before this occurred. But Brad Miller's underneath, he's hustling for the ball. He rips it out. Now he turns around here and fades away. I don't see where he got hit in the face unless it was at the very end down there. He probably got hit in the face. Here's another angle. Uses his strength down low, finishes up, and um, I don't see where the accident came or the elbow. We'll stitch it up and be back in a minute. Thomas, just a sophomore, did a good job against Kenny Thomas of New Mexico, holding him four for 16, 12 points, 12 rebounds. And see if Syracuse picks up full court again. Trapping, Blackwell, Bergen, and Hart, tough target there. Griffin steals it. Backcourt violation. Nope, Bergen's foot on the line. I tell you, that is a very interesting pressing team with Blackwell, Bergen, Hart, all with good size out there, good wingspans. Tough to bring the ball up against them. You have to throw over the top of that press. Ten point Duke lead, 6.20 remaining. Carowell up high with the jumper. He loves that gliding in shot. We saw it last night. Miles Simon, who probably has that down to a science better than any college player I've seen in a long time. It's that glider. Griffin, this is the layup. Loose ball. Great day. Yeah. He tips it to Carowell. Here comes Griffin. Carowell banks it home. Oh, how about that smart play by Battier? It's, he realized he had a man ahead. Boy, this kid plays smart. And Duke has just blown it open. 66-52. Syracuse has not hit a field goal now in almost seven minutes. And you don't want to take that shot trying to come back. Well, it's been the freshman, Jim. When they were recruited, everybody said the top recruiting class in the country. And they have certainly produced here tonight. And they produced when the game had been tied at 49. And you see what's happening now. Syracuse having to go to man-to-man. -to -man. This is not what they do well. I'm surprised that the Mike won't come back with Wojo against this man-to-man. -man. Avery to Brand. So strong. And the freshmen for Duke have 39 of their 68 points tonight. How about that? Well, Jimmy Beheim's seen enough of that freshman class. He's going for a timeout. 
They haven't said if it's a 20. It's a full timeout for Syracuse. Syracuse without a field goal for seven and a half minutes from a tie game at 49 to down 16. His biggest asset is his strength and his mobility down low. Here's the trap. They're trying to turn to get a run going. Cardinals are, are protecting the ball and not turning it over. Now with this nine-point lead, Al, and better than ten minutes to play, McDonald on the floor, Mendez, Seaton, guys off of the Stanford bench, allowing Young and Madsen and uh, Arthur Lee an opportunity to get a blow to be fresh for the stretch run. And McDonald is hacked as he penetrates into the paint. Near the conclusion of every NCAA tournament game, we'll select a genuine Chevrolet most valuable player of the game from each team. Today, Chevrolet has contributed over six and a half million dollars to the scholarship funds of America's colleges and universities. That was a bad foul that time by Alan Eldridge. The, uh, the clock was ticking down. Now you see some of the major contributors in this game on the bench. Miller, though, not for long. He'll check in right now he will spell Jerron Cornell the whole difference in this game was the last five minutes of the first half where Stanford made that huge run and again it was uh, Jerry Collins doing large part to that when Young left and Collins entered to join forces with Madsen they dominated on the offensive glass this lead equaling the largest of the game for Stanford and 11. Tough pass. Cardinal corrals it for Purdue. Should be automatically two. Count it and a foul. No double team that time on the entry. On the seal on, uh, uh, on below, it's automatic. The two fellas out there now for Stanford, Collins and I. Who's number 44 out there? I can't get his name. <laughs> it's... um. Mark Seaton. 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 He, ju he just doesn't have the strength to maintain it. He has another angle on Just feed him inside. Can't defend him. Greg Gummel and Clark Kellogg in New York. We'll keep you updated on what's happening between Syracuse and Duke. But first, we want to give you a quick look at what's going on in St. Louis, where... Stanford and Purdue are doing battle, coming up on 10 minutes to play in regulation, and Stanford has shown what you can do with a big, strong front line, Clark. Rebounding, offensive rebound, they've owned it so far. They really have big three-point shot there by Mosley, Mobley rather, Mosley. But Brian, Brad Miller's had a tough time inside. Stanford's front line, Matson and Young, have just banged them around throughout the game. And yet, the Boilermakers, who are in white in this game, have shown signs of life the last couple of minutes. Well, with over nine minutes to go, Stanford is over the limit with fouls. Purdue, an excellent free-throw shooting team. So being the team that's trailing, you'd love to be able to get points with the clock stop. That means you've got to be aggressive and strong, taking it to the basket. There is some trouble looming ahead for Stanford. Both Mark Madsen and Tim Young, four fouls apiece. Madsen had 15 points with all of them coming in the first half. That is a big note, Greg. Those two guys are so physical and so important to what Stanford does. Purdue's got to knock down free throws. They might have a run in it. 9.41 to play second half. In this, the first game from St. Louis this evening. And Stanford holding a 54-43 lead on the Boilermakers. Well, Syracuse fought back from 10 down at the half to tie the game 49 apiece with 12 and a half remaining. And then Duke just went on a real run, all triggered by the freshman. Two of them sit down as two seniors come back in. Mike wanting a little experience here going up against the press. They've now given Bergen credit for a three a moment ago. At first it was just a two on the board here. You can see Battier wanted to get that ball to Wojo. Nothing going. There's that double team. Syracuse a great double teaming club. Parton with the steal. Bergen pushes it over to Blackwell. Good push off by Thomas. Thomas. Chippy can't get it to go. And Battier. Now, now, Jim, what the Duke players have to recognize is this. Syracuse is going to have five guys playing 
full court pressure on half of the court. What you got to do against that kind of press is to throw the ball long. So Duke would be smart even to break a man long on rebounds because Syracuse is sending five guys to the boards. They won't have that defensive balance they would normally have. So there should be an opportunity for a couple easy layups for Duke. One and one for Battier. That was the fourth on Yanubis. Freshman misfires. And Syracuse trails by 13, four minutes remaining. Still plenty of time with four minutes. Bergen can get it to 10, and does. Still plenty of time. Here you have the trapping in the corners. Now Duke's got to go over the top. See, they don't go over the top. The guys like Farewell and Langdon are wide open. Syracuse ball. In the new playoff, number five, Boy, Avery, Avery comes in for Carowell and Brand after a short break returns. Also number 22, for That's McLeod. Bad. McLeod was the one who turned it over, so he sits. And a timeout called, full timeout called by Duke. Jim, the best way to break, break this is to throw over the top. Bergen with 17 in the second half, trying to keep Syracuse alive. Uh, on the shoulder. Fred James has more, Fred. Now the chin is open, so the chin and the nose are bleeding, and this guy's beat up. And I got to tell you, Gene Cady and the coaches are over here, and they're screaming bloody murder, literally, at these referees saying, you've got to protect my guys because they're getting hammered inside. So Miller's probably going to have to go back in and re that thing. Duke is breaking out long. They have to go over the top and then get a two-on-one break inside, over the top, and get it right down inside. And you notice they don't do it. Syracuse ties them up with a triple team inside. And it was off McLeod, so Syracuse to inbound at its own end. Down 10. It was 40-30 Duke at halftime, now 70-60. And Yanulis and Bergen, two very dangerous three-point shooters on that floor. There's that double team for Bergen coming over the top. It'll be a call against Brand. His third. And you don't want to stop the clock if you're Duke to allow points on the floor. Here's the CBS Sports Line stat of the game. You can get additional tournament stats and information, in depth information, and more on cbs.sportsline.com. Well, Jim didn't, Jim Bayon didn't get points from his bench, but he got valuable minutes so his starters did not wear down. Double bonus the rest of the way for Syracuse. Griffin returns to apply some pressure. If they can get Thomas to make this free throw, they'll get back to the net full court press. You can see Jimmy Beheim substituting offense and defense. He wants his quick defensive guys out there knowing the clock is going to be stopped quite a bit and get Yanulis back in the game. Gives him a chance to set up the press. Now Duke is setting up much higher now than they were before. 16-point lead is down to nine. Inbound to Langdon. Good job by Syracuse. They keep it on. Griffin almost stole it. And they got it across with a second to spare. That's all. Langdon rejected by Blackwell. Make it Thomas. Well, one of the things that Syracuse has here is the ultimate defender. Syracuse's number one shot blocker, number four in the country. That was a three-on-one break. Shows you how good Thomas is by himself. They barely got it across in time. No new 35, so under 20 on the shot clock. Brand should turn and face. You'll find Battier alone on the baseline. Avery doubled up. There's Battier. No call. Battier gets the short one to go. Thomas trying to draw the charge. Battier with 14 tonight. Blackwell answers at the other end. And that was against Battier. It gives you an idea of what a fine play it was. And Wojo cannot afford to pick up a dribble there. Timeout. Really surprised. The veteran player that small has to fight through the double team and keep his dribble alive. Not a good play. It's a 20-second timeout. We saw earlier tonight 
clips from the 91 Duke Championship. How about 92? Grant Hill as a sophomore. They topped the Fab Five in the final in Minneapolis. 71-51. Back-to-back national championships. Jim, when I look at that score, 20 points, that game was a lot closer than that. And you remember how Duke had to struggle to beat Indiana to even get in that championship. Indiana had that furious last-minute rally. Todd Leary came in and hit three threes. Remember that? You remember there was also a little controversy there by a Mr. Valentine and a Mr. Bob Knight with a technical foul in that game. You remember that one? Sounds familiar. 2.30 remaining in this one. There it is. Throw over the top. And right now you can see the instructions from the bench is to go ahead and occupy some time. But Duke is pick it, putting the ball on the floor and then picking up dribbles, and that will really hurt you. Another timeout called. And it's a full timeout. timeout. 2.19 remaining. Duke will have 16 seconds on the shot clock when we come back. Time received by Cardinal off of the elbow of uh, Jaron Collins. Purdue 0 for 10 from downtown in this half, Al. I have many touches, eat up a little clock. Weems launches one. A long rebound to him, and a leader. Oh, the iron, really unkind to Weems. It's downright rude in the second half to the Cardinals. Now or never, they've got to start their run this time down. over Seton. This is a chippy and the reach in foul against Robinson. Well you really feel that that Miller is a player that once frustrated gets out of sync somewhat on the offensive end. I also think he's a little physically tired because he had obviously clear inside position. That should have been an automatic give me and he missed the chippy but I think he's getting physically tired and also physically beaten yeah. up. Yeah. Well you see Tim Young back in the game as you look at our stat of the game. 48 rebounds to 27. Weems looking for his first point. The game is being played now the way Stanford wants it. A half court set each time down. Set up and work the clock. Punch the ball inside if you can. Young's back in with four fouls. Covering Miller. I get Young out of there. I give it down to Miller. Well, he's pretty aggressive with his defense of Miller right now as well. And no double team as yet. Miller senses that. Still has to give it up to Eldridge. Still in the drought from three-point line. Arthur Lee brings it down. Mosley. That one deflected by Eldridge. Acrobatic defensive play by Alan Eldridge. Austin forces it. Cardinal collects it. Player control foul against Cardinal. And he reaches into regional semifinal. And Dukes used two timeouts on this possession. They've exhausted all of their timeouts. Mickey Shashevsky on that well, last possession calling <laughs> for the left-hander. I guess I guess maybe Quinn uh, Snyder. No, no. Jack Marin, 1966. <laughs> oh, okay. Jack Marin was the great left-handed shooter. One of the great uh, forwards ever to play at Duke. He wanted the foul call. Now Duke must remember, only 10 on the shot clock. Good steal by Yanulis. And from behind, Avery knocks it out of bounds. Yeah, it was 66. We talked about that. Jimmy Beheim's last game. Hart looks like he hurt his uh, shoulder there. Jack Marin had the big game against the University of Kentucky in that semifinal. Not quite enough, though, to beat Adolph Rupp's team. Hart can't lift his uh, right arm here, but he's going to stay in the game. 2.10 to go. Down nine. Good backdoor cut by Bergen. Blackwell short on the three. Thomas gets a second chance. Rejected out to Yanulis. Oh, rattles out. This looks like the Connecticut game all over again. And Avery has an uncontested layup. Looked like the Washington players last night, Jim. They just could not get the ball tipped out. Hart. 
put back Blackwell. And last touch by Langdon. Well, this becomes a game of arithmetic now. Down 9, 136 to go. You've got a, a situation where, excuse me, down 11. Four possession game here, folks. So if you're Syracuse, you've got to go for the threes. And quickly. No time to hold the ball. Bergen in the lane. Another wild scramble. Squirts out to Wojciechowski. And see what's happening, Jim. Syracuse sending five guys to the board, so Duke is going to be able to throw that ball along, get themselves some easy layups. <laughs> You know, it was amazing. You looked at the four teams in this regional, Duke, Syracuse, Kentucky, and UCLA, and the team that's been away from the Final Four the longest is Duke. <laughs> well, I would think that when you're talking about Final Fours in the 90s, right? Mike seemed to be a guy that could make reservations each year for, what, five straight years he went to the Final Four. And you know, when you see Mickey up there, you think of the year that Mike had all the problems, the physical problems. And she was the one that really stepped forward and said, you know what, you're stepping aside. You're going to have complete rest. You're going to get yourself healthy. And uh, he eventually had to listen to her. So being back on that bench for all of us that love the game can credit that woman right there for taking control of the family. The Krzyzewski's parents of three daughters. And Wojo hits a bow. Time running out for Syracuse, Jim. As we see so many times, the team makes that run to pull even, and then suddenly it all goes flat. The Chevrolet most valuable players of the game, Todd Bergen, closing out his career here with a double-double, 20 points, 10 rebounds, same numbers he had against New Mexico. And Elton Brand from Duke, 20 points and a career high, 14 rebounds. Well, you can almost give the MVP to the Duke freshman class here tonight because that's what put them over the top. If you're Jim Beheim, no loss one is one that you like to have. But when you think back, Jim, he's been eliminated three times in the NCAA tournament. 92 by Massachusetts in overtime. 94 by Missouri in overtime. 95 by Arkansas in overtime. And remember how that one even got to overtime. That was the famous Lawrence Moten play calling the fifth timeout. Actually, the sixth timeout. So three overtime losses in NCAA tournament play. This one, uh, no easier to take, but those had to really be anguishing. They came back to beat Georgia in the 96 tournament in overtime on their way to the championship game, and they haven't lost an overtime game since. They won five straight. Five straight, yeah. We would have given the freshman the Chevy MVP, but they're not old enough to drive. <laughs> the freshman, 45 points, 45 of the Duke 78 total. They can't even get the three off. They've got to, if they're going to drive, they ought to fire that ball back out. Two's going to help them here. Griffin, a good-looking player. Freshman from Syracuse. 78-65. Duke on to the Elite Eight. Quite a record, too, as a number one seed. We talked about it earlier, Billy. Only the third time. That's surprising with all those Final Four trips. The Duke's been a number one seed. 86 when they lost in the finals to Louisville and 92 which we saw a moment ago when they won the championship against Michigan up in Minneapolis this is just the third time they've garnered a number one seed so they'll be 14 and one now playing as a number one seed the only loss was the Louisville win in the final 86. So Duke with the game well in hand now, 78-65, their lead over Syracuse. And Duke continues their amazing run in regional semifinal games. This victory will improve their record to 14-1 and in 15 of those contests. That's amazing. Meanwhile, let's send you out to St. Louis. Purdue trailing Stanford. Tim Brando and Al McGuire. An eight-point game. Stanford led by 11 at halftime. Foul difficulty has been a major problem for Mark Madsen playing with four Brad Miller playing with three but with uh, a stitched up chin he's had to leave the game several times and the Cardinal and the Boilermakers both struggling from beyond the arc only one three-pointer made by either team with 17 shots taken with 338 and counting in this Midwest regional semifinal game Chad Austin's had kind of a difficult ball game because he's a go-to guy he's their money ball player 
He's only four for 14. Young playing with four, and Tony Mayfield reaching in against Arthur Lee, picks up the foul. His third. Well, we touched on the, this game being a half-court grinder, sort of a, a punch, counter-punch. <laughs> uh, if you look at Brad Miller, it's been uh, technical knockout or not through the course of this game. Well, they, they, they stood need, uh, they stood chin to chin and shoulder to shoulder and just banged all the way through. The refs have done an excellent job. Surprisingly, both these teams, I believe, average about 80 points a game. So this is a real, real low-scoring game for both clubs. The big moment in the first half that really gave Stanford the edge was when Young picked up his fourth foul, and then Jaron Collins, a freshman, the twin brother of Jason Collins, came into the game, joined forces with Madsen. They dominated the offensive glass, and a young man that only averages uh, three points a night has come up with a double-double tonight. Well, he has good hands. He's an excellent post play, but you don't expect the freshman to come in like that and just uh, knock you out of the box. And it, it happened about the last six, seven minutes of the first half. Austin. Boy, he's really struggling. Four for 15 from the floor. Two out of seven from beyond the arc. And uh, with the centers negating one another, you thought he'd be the trump card. Yes, I, I thought because he plays both ends of the floor. And as I said earlier, he's the go-to guy for the Boilermakers. Mosley. Madsen pulls it down. And another example of their offensive rebounding. But if Purdue wants to win, they have stops like this, four or five in the rope. They must score down this other end. Robinson. Wow, that's a big time score there. Now it's down to seven. They got to have one or two turnovers here, but they must stop them down the other end. They mustn't put them on the foul line because they're in the super bonus. Stanford's last field goal came at the 950 mark. It ends with Young's chipping. They maintain the lead. It's been right around the 8 to 11 mark all evening long since that run at the end of the first half. Eldridge at three. Timeout Purdue. Allen Eldridge, the junior from Fort Wayne, has five. Call a 20-second timeout. Want to put their defensive pressure up court, try to turn them over. The look on Gene Cady's face should sum up how this game has gone throughout. It has been the kind of tough half-court physical basketball game that we anticipated, yet Stanford hitting those scoring droughts because of foul difficulty in the second half, really allowing Purdue to hang in. One of the big things Purdue did in the second half, they ended up boxing out the Stanford guys, not allowing so many putbacks. But there's plenty of time left for Purdue to get into this ball game. The big thing, they've got to create one or two turnovers. They must create a turnover. If they don't create a turnover, they're going to have a... They're going to end up ending the season right here. Duke has punched its ticket to the Elite Eight. Stanford and Purdue trying to do the same. For the Boilermakers, it would be the first time since 94. And the Cardinal, of course, under Mike Montgomery, looking to get as deep as ever. You can play man to man, but you must trap. There's the first turnover they get. Now they got to score down this end. There's no rush, but you've got to score. I'd have it down low. I'd give it a Miller down low. Eating up too much clock, Purdue. Austin off the curl. A long rebound, control the Cardinal. Whoa! gets his fifth, a double whammy. Brian Cardinal hung in there, stayed with the ball, hustled all the way through. Got ourselves a ball game, could be a photo. Here it is down low, the shot goes up, bounces around, he stays with it, keeps his eye up on the rim. He never dropped his eye, even though he was cut from below by Matson. And Cardinal does in the Cardinal for the moment. 131 remaining in minutes when we come back. We reset it in the Midwest region at the 
Keel Center in St. Louis. The possession arrow to Stanford. Both teams in the Super Bonus. You see the timeout story. Boilermakers can stop it twice with a full out of 20s. One full remaining for the Cardinal and uh, two 20s left for Mike Montgomery. Well, we've only just begun on the yellow brick road side of the region. Valparaiso, Rhode Island coming up. Many of you will see UCLA and Kentucky. If Brian makes this, it's a one possession game. There he is rubbing his nose. That's when he says hello to his frat brothers. Back at West Lafayette. And a low hello. Pressure up court. Trying to get a turnover now. They don't want a foul. Both teams in the Super Bonus. It is a one possession game for the first time since the closing moments of the first half. Arthur Lee and Chris Weems both on the floor, both capable of handling it. We can see Austin really giving the full court man-to-man -man pressure, giving it up to Arthur Lee. Trick here is not the foul. You got plenty of time. You got to stop him from scoring. Just don't foul. Remember, Weems has not scored in this game. He would be the perimeter option. I'd get the ball down to Young personally. Mosley's not shy. The sophomore from Las Cruces has 10. Cardinal for three. Lee comes down with it, quickly doubled, and that's Brad Miller's fourth. So he joins a plethora of talent that have gotten four fouls through the course of this game. Madsen already out. Here's the unbelievable jump. He gets his balance, squares up, all net. Miller with four. Oh, what a tough game he has played, really, Al. Coming back in the second half, giving some quality minutes. So we touched on Madsen and how important he was. Imagine this. He did not attempt a field goal in the second half. And that was after an outstanding first half where, really, between Collins and Madsen, that was the difference in the game. Well, Arthur Lee Curry and those two. I'm telling you, Bedford Knight would be proud of them. 49 ticks remain in what is now an eight-point lead for Stanford. Now we talked to Mike Montgomery yesterday about uh, the Pac-10, a league, Al, where you had uh, four teams make it to the Sweet 16, thought by many to be top-heavy. After you lose the Washington team, maybe Arizona State, there was a huge drop-off. He said, we're tough. We're ending that stereotype about the finesse league as you look at our reset and again very importantly the possession arrow to the cardinal but don't forget last year when i was arizona won it they were fourth or fifth in their league austin robinson leans in nice drop step move by robinson sophomore from peoria illinois has played well only thing they can do if they get turnovers otherwise the game is over we lost his dribble Boy, very fortunate that time that it was knocked away, not stolen by Eldridge. Weems is limping a little bit. I think he got a knee in his thigh that time down. Has the ball now. Again, the pressure. Eldridge trying to come up with a pick. Now the quick foul. That'll go against Robinson. And for Gene Cady. Difficult choices when you talk about the free throw shooting capability of this team. Now it doesn't make any difference. You foul anybody just to stop the clock. That picture before Gene Cady knocked on the door so many times. He's just going to have to wait another year and come knock again. Made it to the final eight. Had to beat Kansas to get there. And then lost to Duke in Knoxville back in 94. Now, this bracket, of course, in many minds, uh, opened up with Kansas's loss to Rhode Island. But Stanford playing a physical brand that's Big Ten-esque, really giving Purdue all they wanted and then some. Robinson is dry. Miller trying to save it one more time from deep. And that pretty much sums up the way it's gone for Purdue. Stanford in the Elite Eight. thought they may have been overrated when they had that 19 game win streak earlier not so not in the post
last season, 67 to 59, our final score. Our Chevrolet players of the game, and Brad Miller had to fight very hard to hang in this one, playing with four fouls, 13 points, nine rebounds. Jaron Collins, the freshman from North Hollywood,